So it's my pleasure to introduce Will Holkowitz, who is here from um, the University of Wisconsin, Wisconsin, to uh, talk to us. And uh, just a brief intro. So Shimon, I um, believe, did his bachelor at Stanford. So you're coming back here after yes. three years. Yep. And um, you're working with Giorgio, right? That's right. Can I correct it? So, uh, and then did his PhD at Harvard from Eugene Lupin. And, and then I did a postdoc at Jilla uh, with Jimmy. Uh, and, uh, Working on off the last box, which I think it's, we'll hear some about today. Uh, and so Shimon has received many prestigious awards, including a, a Sloan Research Fellowship, an NSF Career Award, and a Packard Fellowship. And uh, we're looking forward to hear what you have to tell us today. So. Uh, thanks a lot, Jason, for the very kind introduction. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, thanks, uh, whoever was responsible for inviting me. It's it's really. Um, an honor for me to be here. It's very special for me because, as Jason said, I did my undergrad degree in physics uh, here at Stanford and actually got my start in physics research in Giorgio Grada's lab in this very building. Uh, I can still really sort of vividly remember the day that Giorgio sort of first led me into the lab and introduced me to... That can be called next door. Next door, so okay. Yeah, so, okay. But they're connected. They're connected. <laughs> they're, they're connected. Did and you then, know that where fact, he was taking you? What? Uh, into the lab? Yes, I did. I, at least that's what I thought he was thinking. Um, and uh, no, and, and introduced me to the grad student. And actually that day, the first day that I was there, the first day that, uh, that uh, you know, Matt, uh, the grad student, successfully trapped single ions. And so I actually got to see single ions for the very first time, the first day that I was in lab. And I sort of thought that that's how physics always works. <laughs> um, it's been a disappointment ever since. Um, but it's, no, but, it, but that is, since then, I've been doing atomic physics uh, research in one form or another. And so this is very special for me. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to come back here and tell you a little bit about the research that, um, that we've been doing on, on testing relativity in the lab and other applications of what we call the multiplex optical atomic clock. Um, so, uh, I do want to mention that actually um, there's sort of two directions, um, uh, thrusts of research in my group in two different physical systems. Uh, one is really on this precision measurement with optical lattice clocks, and the other is actually on, on quantum sensing with color centers and diamond. And I know that there's some of that, quite a bit of that research and relevant research going on here at Stanford as well and within the quantum community here. Um, but today I'm really going to focus in, entirely on the clock uh, research, and if you want to hear about this, you have to invite me back. <laughs> so um, here's the outline and motivation. I'll start by giving kind of a, a brief introduction um, to what uh, atomic clocks are and what they're good for and things like that. And I'll tell you specifically about the physical system that we have in my lab at the University of Wisconsin that we've developed and uh, why we think, think it's exciting. It actually connects a lot to a lot of research taking place in Mark Kasevich and Jason Hogan's labs here amongst, amongst others. Um, and then uh, I'll tell you specifically about some experiments we've done on testing relativity in the lab with this system. And I'll give you a little bit of outlook and, and, and future directions of this research. Okay, so first of all, what is an atomic clock? So actually, I mean, an atomic clock is really the same as any other kind of clock in that you have what's known as a local oscillator, something that exhibits some periodic oscillatory phenomena. It's just a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, that, that's what you use to keep track of time. You just count the periods. Uh, in your cell phones and your computers and everything, they all have some version of something like this, a little quartz tuning fork or something similar that oscillates at a specific frequency, and you just count the number of oscillations on uh, your counter, and that's how you keep track of the passage of time. But of course, the problem with doing that is that every single one of these little quartz tuning forks will be slightly different and will oscillate at a slightly different frequency. And if the environment of the tuning fork changes, if a piece of dust or something settles on it, all of those things will shift the resonance frequency. And so, so that we don't all sort of start to disagree on what time it is, um, we want some kind of reference that we can use to correct. Uh, and the beautiful thing is that nature has given us these beautiful frequency references, which are transitions in atoms. And here I'm showing you the hyperbolic transition in hydrogen, which is actually, this is maybe a little bit misleading because it's mostly used in clocks in a, in a different form where it's an active um, maser, just like a laser but microwave. But nonetheless, you could imagine making a clock where you took this local oscillator, you multiply the frequency up by some number of times, and then you compare it to this hyperfine transition of hydrogen, and you can check whether or not you're on or off resonance with that transition, basically whether or not the hydrogen gets excited from its ground state to, uh, you know, to in induce a spin flip. And if it does, that means you're on resonance. If it doesn't, it means you're off, and you can feed back to correct for the drift of this local oscillator. This is really one of the very first, I would say, true quantum technologies, and that it's using the quantized energy levels of atoms uh, for something really important and useful. And it's really been transformative. I think we take it for granted at this point 
Um, but you know, uh, of course, uh, atomic clocks really are the are, are the fundamental backbone of our navigation system. It's how this morning, instead of remembering the layout of Stanford, I just plugged into my phone how to walk from the hotel to uh, you know to my first meeting. Um, of course, in, in in physics, we care a lot about units and and SI and how we can measure things with units. And now, because we've made clocks so good, they're actually the most precise uh, unitful measurement that we can make. Uh, we now define everything with respect to the second. So every unit in the new SI that was adopted a few years ago is now defined with respect to the second and a bunch of fundamental constants that are just numbers that we've defined. So as you probably know, you can no longer measure the speed of light. The speed of light is just a number that we've defined. And if you want to um, you know, measure the meter or, or define the meter, you use that number and the second, which is itself defined with respect to the hyperfine transition of cesium. So now the extent to which we can make good clocks determines the extent to which we can measure anything with units. And so this motivates sort of you know, making better and better clocks. And then there's a number of other technologies that we may or may not be aware actually rely fundamentally on having a good time of frequency reference um, in, order to, in order to work properly, like for example, certain forms of sensing and imaging. Okay, so that sort of then begs the question, well, given how important clocks are and the fact that, you know, they set the limit on how well we can measure anything with units, you know, how do we make a better clock? And actually, you can look at this process where you compare your local oscillator to this atomic transition and realize that in the end, what you're going to do is you're going to make a measurement of whether or not your atom got excited or made a transition from one state to another state. And that's a, a, a projective measurement, right? You're checking which state the atom is in. And so there's going to be something called quantum projection noise, um, which I suspect many of you are familiar with, where in the end, your atom, you're not going to measure it in a combination of both states. You're going to measure it either in up or in down. And that's a little quantum coin flip that happens every single time you measure one of these atoms. And so that sets a fundamental limit on how well you can determine whether or not your local oscillator is on resonance with your atomic transition or not. And so you can then very simply and straightforwardly write down an expression for how good your clock can be fundamentally limited by this quantum process. And uh, you get this, this limit. Um, and this is a very nice recipe for making uh, you know, a nice atomic clock. And we basically pushed on all the different parameters in this recipe sort of as much as we can. But I want to focus on one in particular, which is this new knot in the denominator. Basically, what that says is everything else being equal, if my transition that I'm comparing to is a higher frequency transition, my clock will be better. Okay. Um, and that intuitively makes a lot of sense because if you want to tell, you know, you know how many oscillations of your local oscillator have happened in a given amount of time, if your oscillator ticks once per second, it's very hard to tell if you measure for a second, you know, whether it's off by a factor of a fraction of a thousandth or something like that. But if it ticks a billion times a second, it's very easy to tell that it might be off by, you know, a, a thousandth. So uh, everything else being equal, we, we want to move from lower frequency transitions like the hyperfine transitions in hydrogen and rubidium and cesium and the other alkali um, elements to higher frequency transitions like optical transitions in atoms. Uh, as you all know, atoms not only have these low frequency hyperfine transitions, they also have these uh, very high frequency optical transitions. Um, that involves looking at the periodic table and recognizing that I said all things being equal. And if you look at this previous expression, there's also this line width up here. So we need a narrow transition to take advantage of this. We can't really measure how well we are on or off resonance of a transition if it's extremely broad. And so we want a narrow transition that's also optical. If you look at the alkali atoms, it turns out that those don't really exist, at least not as narrow as the hyperfine transitions uh, that you have in these atoms. But all you have to do is move over one row on the periodic table to the alkaline earth atoms or alkaline earth like atoms of ytterbium. And suddenly you have, you have access to um, basically very narrow optical transitions. The reason for this is because these atoms now have two valence electrons. And so you have a singlet triplet structure to their energy levels. And transitions between singlet states and triplet states are forbidden by electric dipole selection <laughs> rules. And that means that these transitions can be very narrow. Um, but it turns out that you can still, in some, you know, sort of from mixing in of other states and things like that, have some allowed transitions. So, for example, in strontium 87, which is our element of choice and also the uh, element of choice for uh, Jason Hogan's group, um, you have this amazing, remarkable transition that has an optical frequency. So it's hundreds of terahertz, 429 terahertz, 
but it has a one millihertz line width. And that corresponds to a natural quality factor of something like 10 to the 18. And this is what we're going to use to make a really good clock. Okay, and so uh, since people have started to use these optical transitions as opposed to microwave transitions, clocks have continued to improve dramatically. This is showing this kind of figure of merit that I've been referring to without really explaining what it is, which is this clock fractional frequency uncertainty. This is actually also intuitive. One way to understand this is basically to say, how much does your clock drift from some other clock over some period of time? So it's a unitless number because it's time divided by time. And uh, you can see that these clocks have gotten to really remarkable levels of precision. We're now at the point where um, if you kept two of these clocks ticking side by side from the Big Bang until now, they would agree with each other to better than one second over the 14 billion year age of the universe. Because this fractional frequency uncertainty of 10 to the 18, there's actually about two times 10 to the 18 seconds in 14 billion years. So that's you know, that's where that number comes from and what people mean when they say that. Of course, I will say it's hard enough to keep our clocks working for a few hours <laughs> uh, at a time, let alone 14 billion years. But, you know, we're, we're working on that uh, as well. Right? So with this, you know, really dramatic improvement and you can see, you can draw different lines through it and argue that we're getting some kind of Moore's law type scaling of clock performance. This kind of, you know, really uh, impressive levels of precision and accuracy have opened the doors to all kinds of novel applications of these clocks. And this is showing you kind of a laundry list, but things like searches for new physics. So example, for example, looking for whether fundamental constants are varying in time, which is also connected to ideas to how you might be able to detect certain kinds of say ultralight dark matter through similar um, measurements. And again, um, the atom interferometry community is, is doing very similar things. Um, people, I'll tell you a bit about relativistic geodesy, the idea that you can actually use these clock sensitivity to um, you know, relativistic time dilation to measure Earth's gravity. Um, you know, uh, gravitational wave detection, which again connects to work uh, done in the atom interferometry community, and also tests of relativity, as I'll tell you about today. And there's a few things that I want to point out on this um, uh, uh, with, with regard to all these different emerging applications. One thing is that um, actually most of these applications don't, you don't care about absolute accuracy of the clocks. So in general, one of the things that the clock community and especially the standard institutes spends all of its time worrying about is making sure that you understand everything that contributes to a frequency shift of your clock. Because in the end, if you want to define the second with respect to it, you need to know exactly, you know, if I build a clock and you build a clock, they're going to completely and perfectly agree with each other. And, you know, at some level of confidence, and that has to do with characterizing all of the things that can shift the frequencies of your clocks. But actually, a lot of these applications end up not really depending on the absolute frequency, but just on doing comparisons between two clocks. And in some cases, you may not actually even care about sort of the absolute ratio between those two clocks, but just whether those things are changing in time, for example. So whether those two clocks have something that's causing the frequency of one to shift with respect to the other you know, over some smaller period of time. And so that lets you maybe get away from some of the challenges and some of the paradigms that I think have partially driven clock development and research into clocks until now. That's one point I want to make. The other point I want to make is when you look at a lot of these emerging applications, maybe not surprisingly, it turns out that clocks are just reaching the level now where they're good enough to actually be used for these applications in kind of meaningful ways. And that makes sense because, you know, if these clocks were already really good for it, people would have been doing it a while ago. So the reason these are emerging applications is in part because they're just starting to reach the level that we need to do things like, for example, maybe one day fetch gravitational waves for these clocks in space, um, or to do things like relativistic geodesy, which again I'll talk about in a bit. We're just now entering this interesting regime where these can be really useful tools. And what that means is that, you know, we still need to come up with new ways and new techniques and new, uh, you know, new tricks to keep pushing the performance a bit where it currently is. You know, one option maybe is to just sit back and count on this line to, you know, to take you there. But I, I would say, you know, my my research program is in part devoted to making sure we stay on that line and maybe you can continue to uh, outperform, right? Okay, so with all that as the motivation, we built this uh, strontium optical lattice atomic clock at the University of Wisconsin. This is the, um, you know, the AutoCAD drawing of it, but the thing actually exists. You can, there's a picture of it in there. You can see uh, a cloud of strong atoms in this beautiful blue uh, magneto optical trap. And then down there, uh, you can see them held in an optical lattice. Okay? And the optical lattice turns out to be important. I'm not really going to talk about it, but the optical, thank you, John. 
the uh, optical lattice turns out to be very important for, for taking full advantage of the narrow line length of this transition without worrying about the motion of the atoms and their finite temperature, okay? And so, great, we have the atoms. We need a good clock laser. We need it because our we're looking at an optical transition. Our local oscillator is now actually going to be a, a laser. And since we're probing a very narrow transition, we want a very narrow line with laser. Um, and there are some people who, who devote a lot of their research program to developing better and better lasers. That's not really my area of expertise. Um, and we want to take the ground running. So we actually bought a commercial clock laser system that you can now buy if you have a large enough startup package um, from Menlo Systems. And what's nice actually about this, uh, this thing is it's actually all in this, in this rack, okay? So it's all one integrated system that you could maybe imagine one day putting on a truck or an airplane or maybe even someday in a satellite or something like that. Um, it's not on an optical table. You know, it's, it's not in a room off by itself or anything like that. Um, and, uh, and inside of it is this very nice uh, ultra low expansion glass cavity, it's 12 centimeters long, and this is what you reference your laser to and you lock your laser to to make them line with as narrow as possible, okay? And so now we have our atoms and we have our, our laser and we can see how good a clock we can make, okay? And so to do that, we do something called Ramsey spectroscopy that I, again, I suspect you're, most of you are familiar with, but the idea is that you take this laser light, you shine it on resonance, what you think is on resonance with your atoms, and you do what's called a pi over two pulse, which means you put them in a coherent superposition of the excited and ground clock state. You wait some amount of time, T, and then you do another pi over two pulse, another uh, uh, um, measurement, what this, uh, another pulse with your clock laser. And what this does is it converts the difference in the phase accumulated by your local oscillator relative to the phase accumulated by the superposition of these atoms into a population difference between the excited and ground state of your clock. And you measure that and that gives you information about the frequency difference between your local oscillator and your atoms. And that's actually how you can feed back and uh, correct, for, correct for that detuning and for drifts in that detuning. And what you can see is that, uh, you know, we start out and we see very nice fringes up here. And then as time goes on, our fringe contrast uh, decays. And it happens over the course of 100 milliseconds or so. We lose most of the contrast in our Ramsey fringe. Um, you know, that's fairly long for an optical transition. That's a fairly long coherence time. But at the same time, it's not this 100 second lifetime that I promised you from the atoms. And that's in fact entirely limited by the line width of this, of this clock laser sitting in this rack, okay? Um, and so we can then take that information and plug it into this expression that I showed you before, and we can make a prediction, and this is actually a fairly naive prediction that doesn't account for some of the other things that end up limiting clock performance even worse than this. You can um, plug in the dead time for our measurement and this line width of our local oscillator and how many atoms we have and everything, and you get a clock stability of four times 10 to the minus 16 per square root tau, or in other words, at one second, we get four times 10 to the minus 16 as this fractional uncertainty. That's pretty good uh, for a clock, but if you take me seriously and say, I want to be down here in this region, you can say, how long will it take you to average down to 10 to the minus 20? It would take you 50 years of continuous measurement to average down to 10 to the minus 20 with this clock, right? Isn't that like two breaths? <laughs> not in my head. <laughs> I don't know how they do things there, but um, <laughs> apparently neither do I. <laughs> um, right. So, and that's the important point is that's one measurement of some property, you know, some something down to ten to the minus twenty, right? So, that's not even making any changes, or and it's not accounting for systematics or anything. It's literally just trying to measure some frequency difference at the level of ten to the minus twenty. You'd have to average for fifty years. That's just not practical. So, this looks pretty bad, and it sounds pretty bad, and it sounds like I. I made a poor choice in terms of, you know, what research directions to go in and things like that. But of course we saw this coming, right? And what we did is we took inspiration from other experiments. And in particular, we took inspiration actually from things that are done in the atom interferometry community. Um, so in the atom interferometer community, one issue is actually that atom interferometers are very sensitive to accelerations, which is great because you can use those in accelerometers and you can use them to measure gravity. But it also means that because just everything is shaking and it's impossible to get rid of that, entirely, um, most of the information that you get from the phase of your interferometer is just about what the mirrors that the light you were sending to the atoms were doing in a given shot of the experiment. So what you do is you make two interferometers that experience that same acceleration at the same time, and you look at something that's different about the two of them. And in doing so, you cancel out this common mode acceleration, right? Or another example of the same principle is LIGO, actually. Um, you know, if you were just trying to measure a length change to detect a gravitational wave, 
and uh, you tried to just use a laser and measure the phase of the laser when you sent it there and back, you'd be limited not by the fact that the gravitational wave passed by and shook your mirrors, but rather by the fact that the laser is just fluctuating around in frequency, and so the phase is jumping around all over the place. But what LIGO does is they make a, uh, one of these Michelson interferometers where they have two arms that are of the same length, and you interfere the light with itself. And in doing so, all of that sort of frequency noise on the laser drops out completely. And because of the beautiful quadrupolar nature of gravitational waves, you still pick up this really nice signal uh, you know, from a passing gravitational wave. right? And so we can think about doing the same thing, and that brings me to the multiplex topic for that clock. So, um, so what we did is we designed the system so that rather than just making one clock, we can trap multiple clocks or multiple ensembles of strontium atoms in our optical lattice and probe them simultaneously with the same clock laser. Um, and in doing so, we hope to get common mode cancellation of all this laser frequency noise that's limiting our coherent interrogation time. And in addition, for free, we also get cancellation of all of the systematics that are common modes. So for example, all of the things that people in the clock community spend a lot of time learning about, I'll come to it later in my talk, you know, that can shift your frequency around as long as it's the same for these two clouds, um, you know, there, it's, gonna, it's gonna cancel out. I wanna mention that um, this is not exactly a new idea in the clock community. There's a lot of beautiful work from around the world that was going on before and in parallel to us doing this work and in particular, I, uh, my friend Ed uh, is somewhere in the audience. I've lost track of where. Oh, hey, um, Ed Marty, who's now a postdoc in Steve Chu's group, uh, had beautiful results uh, in, in, in June's group uh, at, at Jilla while I was there on, on doing related things. Okay, so how do we actually do this? Um, this is showing what we do. We've made our optical lattice in a way that we can transition it from a standing wave of light into a moving wave of light. So what you're going to see here is this is our magneto-optical trap where we cool our, our atoms down so they're cold enough to fall into this optical lattice, this potential formed by this standing wave of light, and get held there. And we do that, we, we trap some atoms in there, and then we convert by shifting the frequency of one of the two lasers that forms this uh, standing wave. Um, now it becomes a running <coughs> wave if you shift the frequency of just one of them. And so now I'll show you this animation. When we do that, this cloud of atoms comes along for the ride with this moving moving wave, and then we stop, and now we're loading atoms from our magneto optical trap into a new region of the cloud. At some point there, we turn off our mod, you can see the atoms that weren't trapped fall away. And then we shift back over so that our two clouds are now symmetric with respect to the focus of our lattice, and they're at roughly the same depth and everything and experiencing similar environments. And now we're ready to go. Now we have two plots that we can use uh, to try to do this experiment. So we can do something really ambitious. I told you that the coherence time of our laser, when we compare it to our atoms, our atom-like coherent time is about 100 milliseconds or so with this clock laser. Well, we're going to probe out for eight seconds, okay? And what that means is that the phase of the second pi over two pulse in this Ramsey sequence with respect to the first is completely random. So the outcome in terms of, if I look at a single cloud and I say how many atoms are in the ground state versus the excited state, it's just totally random shot to shot. You can see that it's just noise. It's fluctuating all over the place. You're not getting any useful information out of this measurement because you've completely lost track of what the laser was doing while you were waiting eight seconds in the dark. Okay. But we have two clouds now, and so we can, um, <clears throat> we can probe them simultaneously. We do, and we get the information about both. And you can see from this plot that maybe if you squint at it, it looks like there's some amount of degree of correlation between these two clouds, right? Sometimes there seems to be a lot of white space for both, and sometimes it's up here. But this is not a very useful uh, way to get to, to, to learn very much. So we actually, again, borrow from the, uh, it's interesting, I got a, the wrong slide in here somehow. Um, I'll skip by it, but so we, we borrow something that we learned from the atom interferometry community, which is we plot it parametrically like this. So we have uh, the excitation fraction of one region on the x-axis and the excitation fraction of the other region. So you know, the outcome of the experiment here on the x-axis versus the outcome of the experiment here on the y-axis. And we just plot it point by point. So I'm going to plot exactly the same data I showed you on the previous slide. This is real data that we got in our experiment as a function of time. Okay, and we're just running the same experiment over and over and over again. And what you see is that it traces out this beautiful ellipse, okay? And this is actually just an example of what's known as a Lisajou plot, right? Because what we're doing is we're sampling two different sine waves, the two different Ramsey fringes from this experiment, but now we're sampling it with a completely random phase, but the phase offset between those two sine waves is completely fixed. And if you do that, if you make any, you know, um, offset between those that you want, you end up with an, an ellipse of some form or another. If they were if they were identical, if they were overlapped, if they had no phase offset, it would just be a line. If they were 180 degrees out of phase, it would be a line the other way. 
and in between you get an ellipse. Okay, and we can fit to this and learn a lot of information about the frequency difference between these two clouds without worrying at all about what the clock laser was doing. And so now we can probe for well beyond the coherence time of the clock laser, and we can push from this 100 milliseconds core out to 26 seconds. As you can see here we're plotting the decay and contrast of this ellipse that we're fitting. And here you can see, in this case, it was about 90 degrees out of phase, so instead of being kind of an ellipse, it's more like a circle. Okay. Um, and this now allows us to, to basically get uh, much better performance because we can just do this comparison for a much, much longer time per shot. And so as a result, we get these pretty remarkable uh, stabilities in terms of measuring the frequency difference now between these two plots. So in particular, you can see here now we're averaging down at below 1 times 10 to minus 17 per, per root tau. Um, and we, after only three hours of averaging, get down to the high 10 to the minus 20. We're at 9 times 10 to the minus 20. So here, just in three hours of averaging, we're able to measure, again, the frequency difference between these two clouds um, at, uh, you know, better than 19 digits of precision. Um, okay, now I do want to mention that um, uh, uh, my postdoc advisor, Jun Yi, he was doing similar experiments in parallel where he had an elongated cloud uh, and was looking at it with a, a fairly high NA camera and then was comparing one half of the cloud to the other half of the cloud and he got even better performance than we did. So we got 4.4 times to the minus 18 per uh, you know, root hertz. And as you can see, he was better at convincing his grad students to average for longer. Maybe <laughs> that's why they're flossing. And so he was able to convince them to average for 92 hours, okay? And then they got down to this remarkable number where they're actually measuring this frequency difference with you know, 21 digits of precision, at least below 20 digits of precision. But one point I want to make actually is that uh, June, um, these beautiful, beautiful results. Um, it's being done with the world's best clock laser, um, which is also a beautiful result in and of itself. As I mentioned, some people spend a lot of their time and energy making these local oscillators better and better. And this is a really important area of clock research because this actually determines how well you can make an absolute clock and, and how good you can make your clock. Um, but this system is a cryogenic single crystal silicon cavity. There's only two of them in the world that I'm aware of right now. It's, it's, it's cryogenic, it's pretty bulky, it's in a room off by itself. So this is not the kind of thing you could easily imagine in the near term putting on a, on a truck or on a, on a plane or on a satellite or something like that. And we're sort of still getting similar levels of performance um, you know, with something that's orders of magnitude worse and that does more resemble something portable. So I think that's actually an important point and an important result. So now how are we doing compared to how we were before? Before it would have taken us 50 years to average down to uh, 10 to the minus 20. Now it would take 11 days to average down to 10 to the minus 20. So maybe I need to turn it more into more like June and really push on my grad students a little bit, but still it's you know doable, right? And uh, now it's starting to seem like a more reasonable amount of time that is within a single uh, PhD. Got it, somewhere between 11 days and 50 years. <laughs> so, um, okay. Now I wanna, I wanna make another, another point, which is that, um, uh, this is not a way to make a good absolute clock because actually in any real clock that you're trying to use as a frequency reference or as a time standard, the laser is the thing that's actually you're using to keep track of time and the local oscillator. And here we're ignoring it completely. We're not learning anything about what the local oscillator is doing. And so this is not going to allow us to make a better absolute clock or, or define the SI second better or anything like that. Having said that, actually, I think there are some ways but I want to mention quickly that this kind of architecture actually can be used to make a better clock. Um, and one thing that we realized in the process, actually, I was making a, this talk, essentially, or this slide, not for this specific talk, but I was making these slides for a previous talk. And I noticed something kind of funny, okay? And experts may, may, be, may have noticed it too, which is when you're doing Ramsey spectroscopy, in general, because you have this kind of sine wave fringe, you say, I need to keep the coherence, uh, sort of the interrogation time, below the time it takes me to accumulate more than pi over two phase in either direction. Because once that happens, I lose track. I can't tell if I'm on this side of the fringe or this side of the fringe, right? And I get a fringe slip, uh, like called the fringe slip or a phase slip, okay? Uh, and so that restricts your coherent interrogation time to this condition, okay? Um, but if you were paying close attention to the slide I showed you with this uh, nice ellipse, you might have noticed that I was actually able to assign what the phase was over the full sign 
uh, rather than just over half the sign. And that's because I had two clouds and they were offset with respect to each other. And in doing so, I removed the ambiguity about which part of this sine wave I'm on, right? And the way to think about this is actually, you can think about it like on the block sphere. You know, if I just end up measuring a population on the block sphere, I can't tell which side of the block sphere I'm on. There's kind of an ambiguity there. But if I had two that are trailing each other by some known phase offset, now the, the two populations actually do tell me about where I wound up on the block sphere. And so what that means is that by having these two regions as opposed to one, I can actually double the uh, coherent interrogation time for a given local oscillator line width without actually really paying any price for it. I'm not double counting or anything. I'm taking the same number of atoms and splitting it up into two clouds instead of one and just making sure they have a phase offset. And suddenly I get sort of double the coherent interrogation time and that would give you everything else, you know, ignoring other things like dick effect and things like that, that would give you root two improvement in, in the stability of your clock. So by having sort of two ensembles instead of one, you actually really can make a better absolute clock as well. Um, and okay, so we don't have to stop at two ensembles though, right? We can do the exact same protocol and load as many as we want, really. We're actually limited primarily here by uh, our at initial atom number, because in the end we're splitting it up into a bunch of different ensembles. Um, but here I'm showing you a movie where we load six ensembles at once. Actually, for the rest of the work that I'll be telling you about, we generally operated with five ensembles instead of six for sort of technical reasons. Um, but so the so now our kind of geometry that we have is not just you know two a pair, but actually five, and we get to do pairwise comparisons between all of these simultaneously. And now um, you know you might think, well, I just told you that you can get square root of two better by just having two ensembles. Can I do the same thing with five? <coughs> the answer is not trivially. Okay, so this sort of sign, this ambiguity about whether which side of the fringe you're on, it works with two. But beyond that, it just repeats, and you can't learn more information about whether you've slipped by more than pi phase. But there's other proposals out there for how to kind of extend this. So in particular, you can imagine tracking the phase of your local oscillator with a shorter interrogation time than one, and then with twice that, with a second one, and three times that, and four times that, and five times that. And this will allow you to keep tracking the phase of your local oscillator. And in this paper, they showed that in sort of out smartly allocating your resources like this, so rather than using all your atoms with the same coherent interrogation time, in principle, you can get exponential scaling and clock stability with the number of atoms that you use if you divide these atoms up properly. Now I have to say, we're not, we don't have the capability to do this yet because what this requires is doing different clock interrogation sequences to, to each of these clouds simultaneously. Right now we don't have that capability, but we have ideas about how to do that. And I think this is a really promising and exciting direction. You, know, you can think about sort of smartly using the resources to do optimal phase estimation and things like that. And then going a step beyond this, you can imagine that a lot of, the, a lot of you, I think, or, or some of you at least are working on things like spin squeezing and entanglement as a quantum resource to kind of further enhance the performance of these kind of measurement devices, then I think it's actually really necessary to do these kind of things. You have to think about, you know, in general, if you just take all your atoms and you entangle them and you try to make a better spin squeeze measurement device, it's very rarely is that going to actually give you any benefit. But only when you think very carefully about how you allocate that sort of now entanglement as a resource, can you generally hope to get any kind of improvement in, in, in your performance. So I think these these are these kind of things are going to be the future as we move to more kind of entanglement and has some quantum has measurement device. Okay. So now uh, a very valid criticism of everything I told you up until now is we're measuring the frequency between these two clocks that are basically in the same environment. And I told you it doesn't work as an absolute clock. So you know what is it that's interesting that you can actually measure with this thing? And I think the answer is actually a lot. You, you can do a lot of really interesting things. And this slide is trying to, to give you some different directions that I think we can go in terms of, uh, in terms of doing these you know, very precise differential comparisons. And now I want to tell you about one particular example, where, which is sort of the combination of this idea of geodesy and novel <coughs> tests of relativity, and in particular testing relativity in the lab with optical clocks. Okay, so what are we going to test? Well. I'm sure that you're uh, familiar with this concept of the gravitational redshift, which is sort of one of the uh, predictions of general relativity that was the first tests that were done that were thought to really confirm general relativity, the theory of general relativity, where of redshifts, both of stellar spectra and then later with the pound rev experiment of the actual of mass power uh, spectrum. Hey, but the idea is that if I have two clocks in a gravitational field, 
and I lift one clock up with respect to the other clock, then uh, there's different ways to think about this. But as a result of that, uh, you know, sort of gravitational uh, acceleration, if you want, the um, the higher clock will take faster than the lower clock, and the expression for that is just given by you know the the acceleration due to gravity times the separation height divided by the speed of light squared. Okay, and um, <clears throat> now it turns out that this is actually problematic for clocks because we are now at the level where these clocks are so good that um, if you compare two clocks in two separate labs to each other, in order to get a meaningful comparison between the frequency shifts, you have to take into account this effect. And now the clocks are at the 10 to the minus 18 level, 10 to the minus 18 actually corresponds to on the surface of the earth, raving one clock up or down by a centimeter with respect to the other clock. And so now if you're comparing two clocks that are in separate standards institutes far from each other, you need to know their altitudes with respects to Earth's equipotential, this thing called the geoid, at the centimeter level, uh, or else your comparison is not going to be super meaningful because what you're really measuring is just that you don't know exactly how high these two clocks really are with respect to each other. Um, and so that's a bug, or if you want to turn it on its head, since we don't have any good ways to measure that, so it turns out that centimeters over kilometer scales is about the best we can do with traditional methods of measuring this, that means that now clocks are the best way to do it. And so people are now flipping this on its head and saying, let's take clocks, you know, put them next to each other, measure them, make sure we know that, they're, that they agree, and then move them to some other part of, say, an optical fiber network, uh, as was done in Europe in, in PTB, or uh, you know, uh, in, in, in Japan, um, two different nodes of an optical fiber, or in, uh, up, a, up, a, um, up a tower, the Tokyo Skytree Tower, and uh, use this to actually measure these changes in height more precisely than we can any other any other way. And this is now this emerging field of what's called relativistic geodesy. Okay, and so I think this is one kind of exciting thing that we can push on using these differential comparisons to kind of the ultimate limits and demonstrate how far can we really push these techniques? How, how what kind of height differences can we be sensitive to? But another exciting thing I think is that here we're really starting to see the effects of relativity in some form. Um, at least manifest themselves in a quantum system. And that's exciting because, you know, we don't really know how to combine relativity and quantum mechanics. We don't know how to reconcile with it. They're, they're both incredibly successful theories. Um, we haven't been able to really find holes in either of them, and yet we don't know how they fit together. And so people right now, including Monica's group here, uh, you know, uh, are doing experiments to try to move in the direction of, you know, quantum field theory. There's also a lot of very prominent theorists thinking about things like um, you know, uh, you know uh, quantum gravity and things like that, but we don't know really what to look for, or how to do, and so you know, you know how to do this, how to reconcile these theories. So one sort of I think fruitful direction of research is to really try to start to create systems where these two things directly interact with each other and see if they do work together the way we expect. And there are some really nice uh, theory proposals out there for experiments like this. So for example, you can imagine taking an atom interferometer. Um, where you take an atom and you split it into a you know a superposition um, of two different locations, uh, but also putting that atom in a superposition of two clock states. And if you do this now, this atom is both in a spatial superposition, but it's also on both paths in this internal superposition, and that means that it's sort of sensitive to the passage of time along these two paths. And if this path is higher with respect to gravity than, than this path. Now you're going to get a difference in the passage of time because of the redshift on these two paths. And when you try to re-interfere your atom interferometer here, you won't just get the standard phase shift that we're used to from the potential differences between these two paths. Rather, you'll find that there's certain times where you don't get any interference fringe at all. Your fringe visibility has gone to zero. And that's because the atoms are now distinguishable, right? They know which path they took. And so they don't interfere with each other anymore because they were acting as clocks and actually measuring these effects. And so this is the kind of sort of experiment that I think is really exciting. And we're getting to this level where now we can make systems that are both, we can make super spatial superpositions on, on kind of lab scales, you know, like meter scales, for example. And we can also start to measure relativity on meter scales and even smaller. And so this is an exciting time. Okay, so with that as motivation, we're gonna try to measure the gravitational redshift with our uh, multiplex clock network. And what's really nice is now we have these five uh, ensembles. So we're actually getting a lot of information because we're not just learning about the height difference between one clock and another clock, which is standard for these comparisons. Now we're also learning about simultaneously 
the frequency difference between this block and this block, this block and this block, this block and this block, etc. And so we're actually getting 10 different kind of clock comparisons simultaneously all at once. Um, and so we're learning about the redshift over a bunch of different length scales simultaneously. And so, for example, with a like clock performance that I told you about for these differential comparisons, at one centimeter, the redshift, as I said, is one times seven minus 18. That actually should only require two minutes of averaging to measure the redshift, which is great. Um, and then at 2.5 millimeters, which for this array is the sort of smallest space in between these, we're actually getting four simultaneous comparisons of clouds separated by 2.5 millimeters. But even for a single one of those comparisons, we only have to average for 30 minutes to get, uh, you know, to be able to see the effect at this level of 2.75 times 30 minus 9. Okay. Uh, but that's just to measure a frequency shift on the scale that we expect from the redshift. Of course, we have to make sure that what we see is from the redshift and not from something else. And so that requires a systematic evaluation, right? So we have to account for everything that can give us frequency differences between these plots. Uh, now, the nice thing is they're, they're, they're really experiencing very similar environments. Uh, and we're doing a differential comparison, so we don't care about absolute shift. Rather, we care about differences between these clocks. So what that means is if you go down, if you look at a standard clock, optical clock paper, you know, you see all these systematics that they have to evaluate. Like, what's the magnetic field? Because it's going to shift the frequencies of, these, of, of this transition. Or what's the electric field, right? We don't care about the absolute magnetic field or electric field. We care about magnetic field gradients and electric field gradients because we care about the difference in, that the <coughs> plots. So we have to now characterize all these things in terms of gradients rather than sort of absolutes. And so that gives us some immunity from some of these effects. It means it's almost like a higher order effect now, but it also means that we have to develop some sort of slightly different techniques for measuring these things that people typically use. And just to highlight one example, there's the different thermal environment. So it turns out that the dominant systematic right now, the thing that limits the accuracy, the extent to which we can define the second if we chose to with, a, with these optical lattice clock standards is actually the, thermal environment, the, the temperature of the surrounding environment, and how that actually shifts the uh, internal levels of your clock. It's actually both that we don't necessarily know exactly what the temperature is of the surrounding environment, and also in at least some cases that we don't necessarily know exactly how that thermal environment will change the, the frequency of this clock transition. Okay, But in our case, we don't care about that second part at all. We care about the extent to which these two clocks are in slightly different environments. And I naively thought, how bad could this be? Okay, these are Two, two clouds that are separated by only a centimeter, and the nearest surface actually turns out to be 10 centimeters in either direction, and it's these windows that we have here that are really the kind of closest uh, surface. Uh, and so I thought they must basically be in the same thermal environment. It, you know, I mean, they, they have the, essentially the same solid angles, more or less the same windows, okay? But, um, and people in this community We'll often try to simulate these effects and, and calculate them. I said, let's just measure it. So what we'll do is we'll make one window hotter or colder than the other window. We'll introduce a gradient intentionally, and we'll characterize how much it shifts. And I was really not expecting it to shift very much. It turns out it shifts quite a bit. Uh, so you can see the answer here. We're basically looking at how the frequency across this cloud shifts as a function of this gradient between the top and the bottom window. And in the end, the answer is it shifts at 4.2 times 10 minus 18 per centimeter separation between clouds per Kelvin. Um, so what that means is we're trying to measure this at a centimeter. If you want to see this redshift, that's a 1 times 10 minus 18 effect. So you can't tolerate a gradient between these two windows that's bigger than a quarter of a Kelvin degree Kelvin. Uh, otherwise, you'll get an effect that's larger than the gravitational redshift. Are you telling me to be in your lab? Is uh, sort of. We have <laughs> no. The dominant thing is that we have these bond coils uh, oh. that are actually next to the <laughs> Um, but also I would say that you know it is true that actually we weren't so careful about this. You know, this doesn't get a lot of airflow. This one probably does get more airflow. But I suspect the dominant thing actually is that um these these coils are uh we we flow the same water through both, and the water heats up as it flows through both. So one set of coils gets slightly hotter water than the other one, and it equilibrates at a slightly different. Temperature. Having said that, nothing I told you actually said that because I was just talking about the sensitivity. Um, the actual gradient that we have does turn out to be about uh, 350 millikelvin difference if we don't actively correct it. So yeah, so so that part does tell you that yes, we're doing something stupid, but but um, but the sensitivity is just the sensitivity. 
right, to, to this effect. Um, so anyway, this shows you why these clocks are so hard, right? Because actually what it says is you don't even have to change anything about the clock. If you move these atoms one centimeter or another, and you have a gradient like this, you can get clock shifts that are much larger than the systematic accuracies of these of these clocks. So uh, this this is a good example. But fortunately, I mean, we can. This is one of the techniques that we use to handle these kind of systematic effects, which is we introduce a much larger one, we measure our sensitivity, and then we can measure what the temperature difference between this top and bottom, um, you know, window is much better than these larger gradients that we're introducing, and that that allows us to get a handle on it. It's kind of called a lever arm. Uh, to kind of characterize these systematics. So in the end, we characterized all of these things, okay? And the last thing I'll say is we didn't want to bias ourselves. We kind of know what the answer is going to be, right? It's not going to turn out that over these smaller length scales, the redshift is somehow different than it is over larger length scales. At least that would be a very surprising result. But because we kind of think we know what the answer is, it would be tempting for us to maybe keep evaluating things and keep coming up with reasons uh, until we get the answer that we expect. And so because going forward, we hope to do measurements, I think, where we don't know the answer, we really wanted to uh, do this in a way where we weren't biased. And so we did all of these evaluations completely blind. We added in the software offsets that mimic the redshift, mimic the gradient, so that we didn't know whether what we were getting was consistent with the redshift or not. Okay? And then finally, once we measured them all and decided on our systematic and statistical uncertainties, we unblinded. And only then did we find that um, sort of surprisingly or unsurprisingly, depending on your perspective, you didn't screw anything up, and also the redshift is what you expect. Uh, so here is the expected gravitational redshift, um, it, you know, put in, in now in, as a gradient, so times 10 to the minus 18 per centimeter, okay? And here are, are we did 14 different measurements of it. Our, the red is the statistical uncertainty from these measurements, and the blue is the systematic uncertainty from these measurements. Uh, and you can see that at least once we account for our systematic uncertainty, which is shown here, we see all the different effects. Um, and the largest one really is this black body radiation gradient that we have. Um, we, you know, but in the end, we confirm the red, that the redshift is there um, and that it's what, what, exactly what we expect it to be to within plus or minus about you know, point, point 0.2. So what that means is you can kind of characterize modifications to the redshift. You can say, what if the redshift doesn't scale the way you expect it does with this alpha parameter? It, this alpha is completely, this is the standard for this field, but it's completely different than the fine structure constant. Okay, so it's just some constant that you're saying, how much are you seeing that the redshift varies? And we can constrain that parameter to, you know, basically be zero plus or minus uh, 0.2 or so, which is not so great compared to other uh, limits I'll tell you about in a, in a few minutes, but is still, I think, pretty amazing to be doing on this length scale. I do want to mention again that um, June's group also did similar measurements and actually was able to measure the same effect between the two halves of a cloud over a millimeter length scale. So they actually even saw it over a smaller length scale than he did, uh, and also found, unsurprisingly, that it was consistent with uh, with expectations with the expected redshift. A couple of comments again: this was done with the world's best clock laser, and also not that it matters in this context, but this measurement was was not done blind. So. I think one of the selling points um, of, of you know, our results is that you know, we really confirm that, that these are all the systematics that you, you know, have to worry about and that you know, going forward, we know how to do these, these things in a blinded way so that when we're measuring something maybe a little bit more exotic or a little bit more interesting, we're not biasing ourselves towards one answer or another. And another thing is that I think because they were measuring across a single cloud, um, the, the techniques they used didn't really directly apply to the kinds of things that you would want to do for relativistic geodesy, where you're really comparing clocks at different length scales. And so our measurements map a little bit better to, you know, how well can you really do with these relativistic geodesy measurements? At least what are the ultimate limits to the performance of these kind of measurements and things like that? And so we can ask how good was our resolution to a height difference? So we can plot it this way. This is one of my favorite plots. Now we're plotting separation on the x-axis and the frequency shift that we measure after accounting for systematics on the y-axis. And you can actually see the redshift showing up as a linear gradient across this array of blocks. And you can see that for even the 2.5 millimeter separations, we really resolve that there is a frequency difference because of the redshift. And our minimal height sensitivity was at about 1.3 millimeters or so, which is actually smaller than the thickness of a pen. So we're now able to resolve the redshift between separate clouds you know, using this technique uh, within less than a second of a penny, which is pretty amazing, I think. Of course, we're kind of cheating because these are in the same environment and we're 
using that to get better systematic control. This will be much harder over a longer baseline. And it's not clear, I think it's actually an open question, how much of this common mode noise cancellation you can get if you tried to probe with the same local oscillator over a longer baseline. And that's, I think, a really interesting question that I want to explore going forward. OK, so now I want to finish by just giving you sort of outlook future directions where it's going. So as I said, OK, we can say that we get the relativity, but this number is not super impressive if you compare it to other prior, um, prior measurements. And I'll come back to that again in, in a minute. But we'd like to do better than this. So can we do better? And in the end, we're limited here primarily by systematics. But one important point is our ability to characterize these systematics is really limited by our measurements and how, how good our stability is. Because what you don't appreciate is that to, to characterize all these systematics requires many, many, many clock measurements as you change one parameter or another. And so we spend way more time measuring with our clock to measure these systematics than we do actually making clock measurements to measure any effect or anything like that. So the extent to which we can continue to improve the stability of our clock will determine how well we can eventually kind of rule out or, 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 or you know, reduce our systematic uncertainties for these kind of things. So can we do even better? And you might have been really impressed. I was impressed initially, very happy about going from 100 milliseconds to 26 seconds. But then you could say, wait a minute, though. I, I thought you said it was a 100-second lifetime. Why are you skip 26 seconds, right? Shouldn't you be able to do even better than that? And so we can say, what's limiting this? And the answer turns out to be Raman scattering from the lattice light itself out of the excited clock state. Um, so to get this 26 seconds, we actually even have to go to fairly shallow lattice depths. But so we've been spending a fair bit of time really trying to understand in depth that process um, and to really kind of characterize every single loss and decoherence and dissipation process that's going on inside of our um, inside of our clock when it's inside of this lattice to really try to understand it. And uh, we've learned a lot from this. I should, I, I, sorry, I, I lost the reference, but there was a previous paper from PTB, Dorsher et al. from 2018 that did this in, in, a, in a different, in, you know, in also the astronomy lattice that had previous measurements on this. But so now we have um, some new measurements on this Raman scattering rate out of 3P0. We've also measured all of these other rates. And in the process, because we have very good lattice lifetimes and uh, vacuum lifetimes, we think we've actually directly observed this radiative decay out of this clock state. So we can actually see atoms falling down from the excited clock state and really can confirm this 100 second or so time scale. So this is preliminary, but our number right now is 142 plus minus 30 seconds. We're working on pinning this down even better. But in learning about this and in understanding these mechanisms, We've managed to make some improvements. So our fitted, so our stability now that we see when we do these comparisons is at below seven times seven minus eighteen per square root hertz. So with this stability, it would take about six days. We've gone from eleven days to six days to average down to one times seven minus twenty. And I think we have ways to do even better. And one interesting thing uh, that I want to mention quickly that actually connects a little bit to what we heard about from the very nice student presentation before or my presentation is to make some connections to things people are doing in quantum systems and specifically quantum error correction. And I was lucky enough to be sort of have a, play a small part in a collaboration with Jeff Thompson and Tribute Curie on how you can, in atomic systems, when you're trying to use neutral atoms as qubits, maybe make a better qubit and do um, sort of error correction more efficiently using something called erasure errors. Okay. And what erasure errors are, are there a specific form of error where if you want to think about it, your qubit just disappears. It's erased. Okay. But what's special about that is if that happens, you actually know that the qubit is gone and you know which qubit disappeared. Okay, and so that's a different kind of error than the standard quantum error where it's not, you know, most of quantum error correction is actually figuring out what error occurred and which uh, qubit did, did it occur to, right? Um, and now in, with erasure errors, you don't have to worry about which qubit it happened to. And that significantly reduces the overhead for, um, for correcting these errors. And we think we can do something similar in clocks. So the idea would be, Actually, if you look at these Raman scattering errors, it turns out that most of the scattering back into the excited state leaves you in the same state you started in, so there's not much you can do about that. That will just project to some number of atoms out of the clock state and you're done. But uh, if you end up falling down to the ground state via this Raman scattering, and I'm not showing it properly because it goes through other states along the way, but in the end, you end up in a mixture of different hyperfine states uh, as a result of this process. And now if you think about um, where you started, if you start in a superposition, this is the superposition we typically use for our clock interrogation, the reasons I'm happy to go into if you're interested. After this Raman scattering happens, you know, some of your scattered atoms will appear, but two-thirds of them actually roughly will end up here. 
So if we do hyperfine selective readout, we can rule those out and not be sort of as negatively impacted by those sort of errors or that wrong scattering as before. And so I think that means we can, um, uh, you know, actually do better just by using this and we're working on demonstrating this right now. Okay, so last thing I wanna say, right now we're not at a very competitive limit on uh, modifications to relativity. You can see that actually the best limits are down here at the 10 to the minus, the low 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five level for sort of modifications to this relativistic, uh, general, you know, the gravitational redshift. So I believe that this was our first attempt and just by doing a better job of characterizing our systematics, we can get in about five years or so in about an order of magnitude or so improvement in performance. Uh, and I'm making an analogy to the original pound gravity experiment and then the subsequent pound Snyder experiment that went five years later where they got a similar uh, level of improvement in about five years. But then I think actually we're kind of handicapping ourselves by limiting ourselves to just a centimeter separation. We can still easily do the same kind of experiments, I think, in the same vacuum chamber, in the same lattice even, but over about a meter scale experiment. And if you think about doing that with a meter scale experiment and getting the same level of uh, systematic uncertainty, which is a challenge, I think then we can really be setting actually competitive limits on modifications to relativity. And, um, you know, going forward, this is still science fiction, but, but someday, okay? And then uh, I motivated all this by saying, oh, look, this is really exciting because we can see relativistic effects and quantum superpositions on similar length scales. But actually, if you look at this redshifts that we're seeing right now, and you said, well, you've got your clock for a centimeter, you're coherently interrogating for 10 seconds, you see the redshift, this is great. Why don't you put it in an atom interferometer, make a spatial superposition of a centimeter, and you'll see whether or not these kind of predictions of how these things interact are correct. Well, actually, we are able to measure the redshift, but we're only able to measure the redshift by averaging down a lot, right? Actually, the, the, the phase shift from the redshift over 10 seconds at a centimeter is only 27 milliradians. If you plug that into this expression for the visibility of your interferometer, you would get 0.9999, right? So you would never be able to see this effect at this scale. So what that means is to really do this experiment, you want to accumulate a significant amount of phase difference between these two paths at a meter for 10 seconds. Now you're talking about um, you know, a visibility of zero. And so that's another motivation to go in the direction of meter scale experiment. Of course, the atom interferometry community is way ahead of us on this and they're doing some of these sort of experiments already, but I think this is a really nice complementary direction. And I would also say that in some sense, atom interferometers and clocks are starting to converge a little bit. The line between them is getting very far. So I'll end by again flashing this. There's a bunch of other directions I didn't tell you about that I want to go in, but I'll stop there. I want to thank uh, my group, everybody who did the work, especially the people that did the work on the uh, astronomy experiment where circle and highlighted here. And in particular, my postdoc and now staff scientist, Shen Zhang, really built this experiment uh, from scratch with me and also the funding agencies. The last thing I'm going to say is that I've had a great time at University of Wisconsin. It's been a pleasure to be there and it's been a lot of fun, but I am actually moving to UC Berkeley. Um, so I'll be joining you all, at least in the Bay Area soon. I'm moving there this summer and uh, I'm gonna be doing some rebuilding of the group because uh, sadly not everybody's uh, coming with me. And so the group's gonna be shrinking a little bit, um, but I'm, I'm looking to rebuild and really planning to build this kind of meter scale experiment I told you about. Uh, there at UC Berkeley. So I'm looking for new postdocs and grad students, but I was specifically instructed by the chair of the department that if any of your prospective students are considering going to Stanford or Berkeley, I'm not advocating <laughs> <laughs> one, one institution over the other. Right? But the rest of us are advocating. <laughs> Correct. And with that, I'll stop. And thank you for your attention. Our tradition is the first question was to postdoc or graduate students. So, Chris. Um, so, in the ellipse plots that you showed, um, yes. what limits the differential phase noise? What limits the differential phase noise? Uh, so, you mean the actual? Yes, yeah, so like the spread of the points around the ellipse. Oh, that's QPN. Okay. So, we really think we're at, we think we're really at the QPN limit. That, that was on a lot of the uh, Allen deviation plots that I showed. If you just plug in, what the QPN is accounting for the fact that we have finite contrast and we're doing this ellipse fitting and stuff. So it's not the ideal QPN. Then we really think we're really sitting at the QPN limit. Um, the, uh, we haven't seen any evidence of fluctuations in that differential phase coming from anything else. In other words, it seems very stable. Uh, yeah. So for 
for the differential clock measurement, say with these two ensembles, um, mm -hmm. how much worse can your local oscillator be before you start seeing? That's that's a great question. Okay, so um, uh, that's uh, I, I am funded to answer that question, and I can tell you that we accidentally learned that it can get quite a bit worse, and we won't know about it because when when I showed you this hundred millisecond coherence time. Turns out we did those measurements of our local oscillator uh, sort of atom light coherence time during the pandemic. And then people came back to the building and things got much noisier in terms of vibrations. And recently we went back to actually try to do this two ensemble absolute clock trick that I told you about. And we found that our coherence time, atom light coherence time had dropped from hundred milliseconds to five milliseconds. Uh, and we hadn't noticed because we were only doing these differential measurements and it just didn't matter. Okay, um, and so the so you might say when will it show up? And the answer is once it starts to really limit your pi pulse fidelity. So once it's um, once it's your local oscillator line length is broader than your Robbie frequency, then it will really limit you. And we were kind of starting to see that that our pi pulse fidelity had gone down a bit. Didn't know why, and we thought we were just being lazy and our atoms weren't exploded. But it turned out that was not it. It really was that our clock, our, this rack is kind of sensitive to vibrations. We're on the fifth floor. And so we actually then went around with an accelerometer and measured and found that different places in our room have very different levels of vibrations. And we moved our clock, and now it's actually better than it was even during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, super fun talk. I was uh, inspired at the beginning. You made this point that at the 10 to the minus 20 or yeah. 10 to the minus 21 level, yeah. you could detect gravitational waves. Yeah, one day. Yeah. Well, you said one day, but then you also told me that you and June are making yeah. measurements almost at the 10 to the minus 21 level yeah. over a couple hours. Yeah. So here's my question. Yeah. Are there any interesting gravitational wave sources yeah. with frequencies that low that you might be able to detect soon? Okay, so, right. so the answer is yes, there's definitely gravitational wave sources at those frequencies that are very interesting but you have no hope of measuring them with these kind of comparisons because you're trying to measure a strain in the, in the end or, or a Doppler shift of the light or something. There's different ways to think about it, but uh, you, you, you need a much longer arm length. You need these clocks to be separated not by centimeters as you have here, but by many thousands of kilometers. For but, but could you do something with like laser phase noise cancellation? So example? it's, so my understanding, it's really interesting question. My understanding is not on earth because that you know, in the end, you have Newtonian noise, and 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 so basically, there's enough gravitational noise from the Earth itself that on the surface of the Earth, you can try to do fiber phase noise cancellation and everything. But whatever you're referencing your clocks to is still going to have this sort of noise from accelerations and gravity from the Earth that that will hide any. Uh, and this is why LIGO, like you can't build a version of LIGO, no matter how good you try to make your isolation and everything on Earth that can sense, you know, millihertz and decahertz gravitational waves. So you need to go to space. But in space, the answer is definitely yes. And that's, I think, the direction that, you know, atom interferometers and clocks are trying to go in. There are some arguments for why atom interferometers, where your atoms are in free fall, as opposed to our clocks, which are referenced to some mirror or phase reference that sets the lattice. Maybe you can get around this. So people are trying in Europe to build forms of detectors that, where they think that you can make this Newtonian noise common mode and somehow cancel it out. I have to say, I don't fully understand that. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I don't, but either way, I don't think it translates to these clocks necessarily because, you know, if you have a if you have something that sets the phase, like where your atoms are sitting, that's determines your, you know, your lattice, then that thing is going to be shaking and you're not going to be able to tell that it's a gravitational. So I have a question for you. So you mentioned this loss mechanism that uh, yeah. is scattering to yeah. degree of one, and then yeah. you need this strong scattering. Yeah. So I'm wondering, so that's up on your, 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 your clock is, your okay. tuning is what it is. So I'm wondering, you know, in the spirit of it's a differential measurement, yeah. could you just use, do you have to use the magic wavelet? Like, why not to tune it further with something else? Yeah, right. That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, it does turn out that for this really long interrogation times, we, it's actually in our paper, I don't show it here. If we tune our uh, lattice by even hundreds of megahertz, the contrast of our ellipse starts to shrink. And that's because the atoms are uh, experiencing different depths. Like even within a single cloud, they're experiencing different depths of the lattice because of their finite temperature in the third uh, sort of, you know, axis, the like irritable two axis. But yeah, the, 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 the radial direction of this lattice. And so, uh, so yeah, we actually do need to really be at the magic wavelength 
Uh, but it's a good, it's an interesting point. In yeah. question. I think we can still, in principle, go to lower <coughs> depths than we're currently operating at. It's not clear that we're exactly operating at the optimal depth. Um, we have some sources of heating and loss, like shaking of our lattice, and possibly the fact that the lattice is slightly tilted, and the amount, of, you know, so and the, the sort of geometry such that if we go to lower depths, we start to actually just lose atoms, our, our, our lifetime of atoms in our lattice. Hey, ben? Um, I actually had sort of a follow-up question, which yes. is, are there any uh, blue tuned magic wavelengths? Yes, there are. People have, uh, so people have uh, done, Katori uh, in Japan did some early measurements, even with a 3D lattice clock with a blue detuned lattice. Um, it's, of course, more challenging to make a one-dimensional uh, uh, blue detuned lattice. You can't really do that unless you, so, uh, but um, but you could do higher dimensional clocks, and those do exist. Uh, I haven't really thought about whether you could use the specific architecture that we're using in that geometry. It's it's hard. I mean, you can think about like like we like this one D lattice architecture because it's really easy to load these multiple ensembles and to do this moving around and things like that. Um, but you can imagine maybe doing that and then turning on additional lattices or transferring from one lattice to another. There's no reason that we actually have to do this loading and moving in our magic lattice although that's what we do so one thing that i want to do in this next generation experiment is probably load with some other wavelength uh where the ground state is even more strongly trapped and then only when we care about the actual interrogation do we transfer into this sort of uh you know magic lattice so one more question because the sean you still have it uh, i'm just curious at what level does the second order doctor shift um, that's a very good question. It turns out that for the temperatures that our atoms are at, it's it's quite a bit lower in in these um, in these lattices. Uh, I don't remember the numbers off of the top of my head, but I remember being very small uh, in uh, you know. But it will show up somewhere. And it's a it's a very good question. I have to double check exactly where. But it's not like the uh, ion optical clocks where it's one of their dominant systematics because they have this much larger micro motion. In uh, yeah, in the in these in these lattice in these optical lattice blocks, the the thermal you know the the thermal motion in the other direction doesn't give you a very large second order of I guess when you're making like splitting up your clouds, uh -huh. do you like excite? Oh, uh, no, we we so I mean yes, we do, but we cool afterwards. So we we actually do all of our preparation and cooling and things after we've generated uh, these as many ensembles as we want. Um, so we're not really limited by that. And actually, surprisingly, we don't see a huge amount of heating. And in some cases, we even sort of see some form of cooling where it's more like a evaporative cooling where we just lose the hotter atoms as we accelerate. And so our atoms actually tend to end up, if we start from just the, the MOT temperature without doing any cooling after doing this loading, we end up with fewer atoms, but they're colder uh, than we started with. But that's cool. Any other questions, but I'm going to call it there. So thanks again, Shimon. Great talk.